So I'm not going to give you actually, I don't expect too much of an answer. But hopefully I'll provoke some thoughts about as to how we use enzymes or how we actually use different feeding strategy or strategies in the tropics to make enzymes look better. So I'm going to cover very quickly, I had actually had five different topics and I took two of them off just a few minutes ago because we are running short of time and I'm responsible for a part of that delay. Evolution of feed enzymes. So we have NSP, non state polysaccharide integrated enzymes, phytase and proteases. So I'm talking about these two different, three different enzymes. In terms of feed NSP enzymes, first we start to use enzymes in viscous grains. The viscous grains are rye is a prime example, but the main grain is wheat. So many parts of the world use wheat. Wheat contains soluble non-state polysaccharides, predominantly in the form of arabinozylans. So that's one of the viscous grains. Then we have barley. Barley contains almost equal amount of soluble arabinozylan and soluble 131 for beta glucans. So two different types of soluble non-state polysaccharide in barley. Oats also contain quite a bit of soluble non-state polysaccharide. That's again arabinozylans as well as beta glucans. But oats are not very much used in feed. So wheat and um, barley. Then we talked about, okay, we're going to have non-viscous grains because if we just focus on using enzymes, the enzyme market will be constrained to those parts of the world that use viscous grains. So we have to come up with more enzymes, different types of enzymes, to cover non-viscous grains like corn. Many parts of the world use corns. So we added non-viscous grains, cereal grains, then that, okay, can enzymes work on vegetable protein like soybean meal and canola meal? So those are the feed enzymes in a very quick snapshot. So first one is viscosity reduction. So that's viscous grains. When it comes to non-viscous grains, you're looking at opening up the cell walls so that some of the nutrients enclosed or caged in in those cell walls may be released and exposed to uh, endogenous enzymes in endogenous conditions. So you can then veg vegetable proteins, that's quite a big challenge. To date, we have not been able to make a lot of inroads into degrading the pectic polysaccharides pre presence in vegetable proteins. So there are a lot of competitive production of various phytases and proteases. It's very widespread use of them. For example, if you look at phytase and protease, so ex I just talked about the carbohydrates. Then proteases now has been introduced and people are using them. So how do they actually work? But I'm not going to cover all of these substance subjects in this particular talk. So in summary of this quick summary of enzymes, is continuous improvements have been made. The yield of enzymes are very, very high now. The stability is, is better and activity is greater. So those are the feed enzymes. Very widespread use. And when I started research in feed enzyme usage, you're looking at about $35, $40 additional cost per ton of feed. And a lot of people used to joke about it when I was talking about enzymes. And, ah, look at that fellow came up and still talking about the poo-poo dust. So that was the name, but now feed enzymes are part of today's feed formulation. There's no doubt about it. Now, will that differentially affect performance under hot conditions? Can enzymes alone be used to alleviate part of the burdens imposed on brawlers and layers by hot conditions. 
So that's a very big question and I've been thinking about it and I've really been scratching my head more than actually coming up with answers. So there's one of the things that I would like to talk about today is intermittent feeding in conjunction with enzymes. This is not a new concept, but it can be used as an idea that could actually improve feeding brawlers or layers under heat conditions. Heat dissipation is a key challenge for feeding brawlers in the tropics. And we heard about Dr. Ferry's talk this morning and the spikes of heat stress associated changes, mortality or digestibility or feed intake job. The key issue is low feed intake. When birds are very hot, gasping for air, the last thing it wants to do is to eat more. Without eating more, it will not grow. Without eating or taking the appropriate amounts of nutrients, they are more vulnerable. Their gut systems will be more vulnerable to diseases, subclinical infections, and all the other issues associated with it. They are already vulnerable. On top of that, if nutrients are not adequately supplied, they will be even more vulnerable. Now you also heard that like countries like Indonesia just said you are not going to use AGP anymore. You are not going to use sub-therapeutic level of antibiotic, antibiotics in feed. Take it out. So that's a huge tool that is going to be missing from the industry. As that that's the huge tool that used to mask whole heaps of issues that could surface, especially in the, in the tropics in the future. So that's the challenge. That's one of the challenges and I was talking about in the morning. And in our particular feed industry, we are going to face, and we need to face it. We need to embrace it, and we need to change it. But how? Well, thinking. Nothing is going to beat a thinking mind. I think that is the, that is the approach. Thus, changing feeding regime might, might take full use, full advantage of the enzymes. So what am I talking about here? So if you look at the jungle, red jungle fowl is coming from this area. The grey jungle fowl and red jungle fowl is coming out of this part of the world in the park. This is hot, humid and uh, in the tropics. So that's the ancestor of today's chicken. How did they eat? When it's very hot, they rest. Sitting under a tree sitting in the she shade, they were not scavenging, they were not eating. When it cools down, and they start to eat, and nibble and eat. But what happened today is that we have turned it completely upside down. We give them 18 hours of continuous feeding and stimulated by continuous lighting and sometimes 23 hours of lighting and one hour darkness. Because the idea is to let them eat as much as they could so that they will grow and convert the feed efficiently. This is an interesting picture. One of my students and looked at it in pitch dark with infrared camera, thermo, thermo camera. Some birds actually eat during pitch darkness. Not all of them, some of them, very few of them. And it's an interesting, I mean, I actually, at the beginning, I actually denied it. When she said, well, you know, some birds actually eat during the night, I said, ah, no, no, it's too dark. Then she said, well, I'm going to demonstrate it to you. And look at this little bugger. It was, it was eating right in the middle of the night. It's completely pitch darkness. It's just a little side story. Retention of feed in the crop scavenging very commercial birds. 
So I just wanted to show you some data. The average dry matter content in a crop of a rural scavenging birds, it's 17 in a short range season is 17 grams, long range season is 12 grams. And adults about 20, over 20 grams of feed is stored in a crop. Crop is something we forget about today in the commercial birds. But if you look at the modern birds, at libidum fed, 31 day old brawlers with different amount of feed in the dry matter. So 10 and five grams of feed at the beginning. Then at the end, the amount of feed drops. There's hardly any feed left. And a few minutes later, so the crop as an organ, storage organ, has already lost its function. So if you look at this gut pH and digestive retention time for you know, enzyme activities, so you look at a crop, the pH here in this particular one is crop holding was only 12 minutes, pH 4.3 to 5.9, and proventriculus 37 minutes here, and pH dropped down 1.6. And then coming in a small intestine, 87 minutes, pH is 6 and 6.1. Then you come to jejunum, 6.5 is going up, 80 minutes. Then it comes to the seeker at 6 point, uh, 5.9, 6.9, so 6.4 on average, and a cloaca, and it's out. The chicken is an extremely efficient animal. So within 270 minutes, the birds, a totally starch-based diet can be digested by the bird. However, when they are under tremendous stress, we are really pushing them very hard. So if we actually feed them the way that they were fed, in the, uh, they grow up in a... Uh, in, in nature, adapted in nature, we may be able to actually change the way that tropical poultry production is done. So modify feed retention in the foregut. So the idea is that we want to actually manipulate the birds and get them hold a lot of feed in a crop, in a foregut, so that it'll be conditioned, the acid will be better, you know, the pH will be lower, and digestibility will be higher. So actual pH of the feed in a, in a crop, lighting management, the period of time, that can also help, help the gives it holding, i uh, sorry, crop holding, and presence of physical components in the diet like whole cereal or fiber that can also encourage gives it holding and particle size, coarse particle size is also very important. So there are a number of strategies that can increase foregut holding. But in this particular trial, we looked at intermittent lighting and how it actually stimulates gizzard holding. So we had 624 Ross 308 male chicks, day zero to 34, six replicates of 13 birds each wrap. It's a two by two by design. So lighting programs continuous versus intermittent lighting. And we had enzymes, phytase and xylanase. It's a wheat soy diet, so three phase commercial type feeding. So the lighting program, this is the continuous 18 hours light and six hours darkness. The so intermittent feeding, as you can see, is one hour light and three hour darkness, one hour light, three hour dark, then one hour, one, three, one, three, one, three, and right at the end is two hours light and six hour darkness. Well, we were a bit lazy, you know, we didn't want to sit there and switching the lights off during the night, so we just conveniently made it eight hours at the end. So I just wanted to run through this, a lot of data in this, 
So if you look at these lighting programs, continuous or intermittent feedings, the continuous feeding was higher in weight gain. So day 25, it's one, nearly 1.3 kilos, so it's very, very high. And it roughly takes about four days before the birds start to hold a lot of feed in a crop. So it's not immediate. It takes a bit of time, four days to seven days, to actually get used to the regime. So if you look at feed conversion ratio, look at this, 1.371 versus 1.390. So it's roughly two conversion points of feed is saved. So 20 grams of feed per kilogram of live weight. And that's a lot of money around the world. Somebody estimated that that is about a billion dollars savings if it's realized on every bird raised on the, on the planet. So it's not a small amount of money you're looking at. Phyto supplementation as supplemented versus non-supplemented. Okay, you expect that and feed conversion, it's not significant, but you can see the trend. Xylanase, it's again as you expected. So the birds were fed, instead of 16, uh, 18 hours light, six hours dark, it's actually 16 hours dark, uh, 18 hours dark and six hours light completely inverted, yet those birds were able to convert feed more efficiently. And the enzymes were significant in that sense as well. And if you look at the gut pH, that tells you the story here. So the crop pH, lighting from intermittent feeding, from 5.09 dropped to 4.81. That is a massive drop. So what is that telling you is that chicken, the chickens start to hold a lot of digester for a longer period of time. So fermentation in the crop started to occur at a much larger, much quicker phase. So that means that if you actually, it's possible, this is hypothesis. So if you have high fiber, low digestibility feed, and if the birds keep them in a the crop for a long, long, longer, longer, in a longer period of time, and you could increase digestibility, could produce you know, in situ probiotics, or prebiotics, even by the natural fermentation pattern itself. And as you can see here, okay, phytase didn't have any effect on pH, but xylanase. Again, it's reduced it, and gizzard pH with xylanase, 3.57 to 3.18 has dropped. Again, it's a massive drop, pH. So what does it tell you? It tells you that when you give xylanase to birds and they start to produce more, a small fragment of a carbohydrates that are in turn fermented by the animal to produce volatile fatty acids. And we all heard about the prebiotic effects of xyloligosaccharides produced in situ. So in summary, so intermittent feeding produced lower weight but better feed conversion. We've also done some more work now that lower weight can be compensated as you put the birds up to 40, you know, 40 days, 35 to 42 days, and at the end, the weight gain actually catch up. So the birds' adaptability increases. And better enzyme efficacy under intermittent feeding, lower pH and lower also pH with xylanase. So these are some of the strategies that we could use to enhance the use of feed additives of in combination of feeding strategies to deal with heat stress. So you can read that, thank you. Thank you very much, Mingan.
pretty sure there will be questions coming up. Well, the first one is already um, quite a challenging one, I think. What are the most effective enzymes to use in broilers as well as in breeders to overcome the heat stress and its needs? And it, and it needs also viable in costing. Effective and cost effective. Any comments on that, Mingan? It's an incredibly tough question, obviously. So do not take this, this. I have no experimental evidence, but I'll hypothesize here. So, for example, net energy is affected by the type of nutrients remaining in a gut. So proteins are the most expensive nutrient in terms of net energy, cost a lot of net energy. So if we formulate diets in a way that, we, for instance, protease reduces the remnants of proteins in the gut, that may reduce heat, heat increment, so net utilization of energy under heat stress environment might be, util might be increased. But again, I stress that I don't have evidence. This is hypothesis. I think the next one is, um, is very interesting. Um, is there any difference between pelleted feed versus mash feed with respect to um, retention in the crop? Mash feed is retained more, I think, and there has been some work in that area. Then we come to, uh, well, I don't know about, the, about this one. Uh, what should be the standards? Oh, NSPs versus single cell protein? No, I don't think we should pick that one. Eh? Um, what should be the standard energy and protein ratio to overcome heat stress? That's a tough one as well, I'm afraid. Standard energy and protein ratio, no, I don't know. No. No. Sorry. <laughs> right. Very interesting question. I think it will probably be discussed during our workshop next, formulating under heat stress conditions, because protein Giving you a figure on protein will be totally misleading because different amino acids will work differently. So energy to amino acid ratios, and which amino acid and what ratio? So that's the question you're trying to ask, and therefore I'm saying no to it because if I give you a ratio to protein to energy, and that's not, not good for anybody. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mingan. I think it was... Um, a very, very useful uh, overview with respect to uh, enzymes. Thanks, thanks again. Thank you.